Well, we'll cross to the other side of the studio now, where Diptyka Laurent is joining us for the next look at the day's papers. So, Dipti, there's still a lot of focus on Transnistria, that pro-Russian uh, republic in Moldova. That's right. There's a lot of um, articles in the press today about where this is. And actually, let's start with the Courrier International, which is a French news magazine. Um, they've got a, a nice little map that sort of helps you f understand where exactly this region is and why it's important. Uh, of course, it all comes after the explosions reported in Transnistria, which Ukrainian officials accuse Russia of being behind to justify a potential invasion in Moldova. So as you see there, Transnistria, it's a uh, self-declared Russian republic for many years now that sort of straddles Mold Moldova and Ukraine. Um, and it's uh, it's not internationally recognized, so, uh, and but it is also one of the reasons why Moldova fears it could be next to face a Russian invasion. The New York Times reporting that a Russian general said this week that gaining full control of southern Ukraine would allow the Kremlin another point of access to Transnistria, hence the fears of that second invasion. Uh, according to one think tank, though, it seems unlikely in the imminent future, even if it does seem like a mid to long term plan of Russia right now. Now, in the meanwhile, uh, Dipti, the magazine Foreign Policy is looking at how Russia is leading a similar strategy in Moldova, to, similar to what it did in Ukraine. That's right. Well, last week, a Russian military official said one of Russia's goals in the war in Ukraine is to create a corridor for the people of Transnistria to prevent the, quote, oppression of Russian of the Russian-speaking population. These are words we've heard before. It's what they said about those separatist republics in Ukraine as well. Uh, comments that one Moldovan politician tells Foreign Policy was a deliberate strategy strategy in Russia's sort of information war to discredit Moldova and somehow drag Moldova into this war now. Uh, the magazine notes that an annual foreign intelligence assessment this year found that the Kremlin is actively working to oust Moldova's pro-European leadership using a range of tools like Moldova's Russian energy dependence to undermine the government. And to be speaking of that energy dependence, Russia has cut off natu nat natural gas deliveries uh, to Poland and Bulgaria today in what's been described as blackmail. Yeah, and it's making uh, the papers in both Poland and Bulgaria. Let's show you the Polish paper Gazeta Wyborcza. So Poland and Bulgaria have refused to pay for those deliveries in rubles uh, as, as Russia has been demanding to sort of get around the issue of financial boycotts. On the front page of Gazeta Wyborcza, the Polish daily, they're very defiant today. They say Gazprom terminated its contract with Poland Poland, because Poland will, will not sub succumb to, quote, Putin's ruble diktat. Uh, as I said, Russia has demanded payments in rubles. Uh, the Polish paper also noting that Russia's move will have little effect on Poland's energy needs because its gas storage facilities are at 80 percent capacity, uh, and uh, the country has already begun exploring other options for gas imports. The Bulgarian news website um, Standard, uh, meanwhile, calls the move from Russia extraordinary, noting that Bulgaria the Bulgarian side has fulfilled its side, its side of um, its obligations in, in accordance with that contract and, and says that paying Russia in rubles is just too much of a risk right now for Bulgaria. Now, moving on now, uh, Deepsea, to Singapore, where authorities executed a Malaysian a man who's convicted, convicted of drug smuggling drew widespread international condemnation. That's right. Uh, the Malaysian man, Nagendran Damalingam, was executed early on Wednesday morning. Uh, the reason his case drew such widespread uh, attention attention and, um, and drew calls for clemency, notably from high-profile people uh, like Richard Branson, for instance, was because of his intellectual disability. He had languished on death row for about uh, over a decade on uh, heroin smuggling charges, despite several appeals to commute his sentence. His IQ was found to be at 69, which is sort of considered an intellectual disability. The courts, however, the Singaporean courts say he knew what he was doing when he smuggled those drugs in, and they've maintained that the death penalty is the most efficient way to fight against his crime. Nonetheless, his death um, has been condemned by a group, a lot of uh, sort of um, NGOs, including uh, Amnesty International, Erin. All right, Dipti, finally from you, the Guinness Book of World Records has crowned a new woman as the oldest in the world. That's right, and she lives right here in France. Her name is, uh, her title is Sister Andre, uh, she's 118 years old. She's the oldest living person in the world now. Uh, she's also the oldest living nun in the world. Her name uh, is Lucille Rondon, and she's a daughter of a teacher. She, uh, she dedicated her life to religious service, but before she became a Catholic nun, she um, she looked after children during the Second World War, and then for three decades, uh, she took care of orphans and elderly people at a hospital. Um, she says, uh, according to Le Figaro, that one of her most beautiful memories 
memories is seeing her two brothers come home after the First World War, uh, which she says at the time was something very rare. And when she turned 118 this year, Emmanuel Macron actually hand wrote her a little birthday card. Uh, she has indeed seen 18 French presidents, Erin, 10 different popes. Uh, she credits her longevity to a, a, a nice, peaceful daily routine with um, a good breakfast, she says, long walks, and yes, a glass of wine at midday. Proof of that Mediterranean diet along with some wine <laughs> does indeed work. Zutika Laurent, thank you very much.